unlike our previous speaker, uh, Dr. Jennifer Priest is English, <laughs> and or pardon me, is Canadian, but uh, got her PhD at the Open University, where she was a professor for 15 years. She is the author of some seven books and numerous papers. She is also in the subject of so-called HCI or human construct interaction, but with a specialty on. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and her bachelor's was at the Uni University of Ulster in biology, so she's very well-rounded. Uh, uh, her specialty now is online communities. And without further ado, Jennifer Priest. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I even still speak English a little bit. <laughs> and, I, and I'm training Ben, but, you know, he's not a very quick learner on this, this, this front. He's very quick on other things, but still, still has a bit to go with the accent. Um, well, thank you very much. It's delightful to be here, and thank you to Ted, and thank you to Marlene for um, this nice invitation. And thank you to all of you, because it's already four o'clock, and I will endeavor to get done by five. <laughs> um, I've got a number of, of slides. It's up to your conscience. You can go on and on. <laughs> all right. Um, I've got a number of slides. I'm going to go through the ones at the beginning fairly quickly, because they just give you a, sort of an idea of the kinds of social technologies that I'm particularly interested in. And then I'm going to talk uh, mostly about sociability and mapping sociability to usability and focus on one particular project that we are doing at the University of Maryland, and that's concerned with the um, International Children's Digital Library that Ben mentioned to you, and this is actually an international children's digital library community. So the basic outline of the talk is uh, just basically social interaction online and my argument here is that you know we talk a lot about usability and people I think are pretty accepting now <coughs> that usability is an important design feature um, but I don't think usability is enough or at least I don't think the in initial definitions of usability are sufficient that we need to pay much more attention to social interaction, social collaboration and uh, support that so sociability and map the sociability onto the usability. Uh, so I'm going to talk about sociability and how we map that onto usability and then talk about this book community project and like Ben did talk a little bit about future future directions. So the basic terrain, I think, of this area of social computing, as it's now popularly being uh, called, I think mainly as a result of a conference that's been held now for three years by Microsoft in, Ke in Seattle, uh, but which I also think of as online communities or communities that use technology. And I think these whole sort of um, definitions have been shifting o over the years. I tend to stick with the, uh, with the term online communities, although communities these days are far from being totally online, if they ever were indeed. And in fact, mostly the communities are happening offline, supported by the technologies. Um, but in order to study these domains, I think we bring together an interesting variety of, of subjects, sociology, communications, information technology, information systems, information s studies, uh, linguistics, semiotics, anthropology, social psychology, and there are probably others as well that you can think of that aren't in there. Um, I'm, uh, I'm currently um, a professor and dean in a college of information studies, and so my area is, is applied computing and thinking about applied computing within the areas of texts and libraries and communications. Um, I study a lot of different types of uh, uh, computer-supported cooperative um, communication, um, CMC, uh, including, and, and I think some of the interesting ones are those technologies that are often quite rudimentary. And I've found this, which I thought was extremely interesting, which is a, an online community for online community specialists. And the interesting thing is that it uses the web and it uses a simple list server. And clearly, this is a very uh, easy, easy way of communicating, and it transcends the problems of accessibility to a large extent. Anyway, the others you will probably also be very familiar with, so let me go through them rather quickly. Web-based discussion boards that I've worked on a lot, thinking particularly about how people work in patient support communities using those technologies. And the interesting finding there, I think, is that 
uh, the kinds of communication that goes on is very similar to the kind of communication that goes on in face-to-face -face groups. And broadly speaking, we can use already existing um, models from people like Benny and Sheets, which show that approximately two-thirds of communication is factual exchange about diseases and problems, and uh, about one-third is social, um, social support for support uh, for illnesses. Blogs and wikis, uh, instant messaging and texting, of course, and the whole uh, issue of mobile devices. And I think somebody mentioned earlier Howard Rheingold's interesting work, which uh, focuses a lot on these ephemeral communities that we can bring together through mobile devices. And this, I think, is even more prominent in Europe than, than it is in the United States, and particularly uh, in, the, uh, in, in countries which are not so financially well endowed, like uh, Brazil, uh, areas of <coughs> India and Asia, where often people uh, cannot afford laptops and sort of what we sometimes think of as the higher end computing systems, or we could think of as the old fashioned technology, depending on your perspective, they can afford and in fact do have. And you see in the poor areas surrounding Rio de Janeiro, for example, uh, in the favelas, the shanty towns there, you see that very often they have the most up to date um, phone systems and they're, they're, they're texting and, and using those in their communication. Video conferencing, of course. Uh, I think some of the e interesting ones are technologies that enable us to support face-to-face -face organization. We saw this meeting organizer, meetup technology used a lot in the uh, American elections, uh, particularly by the Dean campaign for calling together groups of supporters to, to work to get the vote out, to communicate and basically support their, their man. Uh, social network software is now very well established, things like Friendster, LinkUp, and, and various others. All these are of interest to me. Uh, popular in many of the university uh, campuses are things like MySpace, and of course there are many specially um, designed worlds. This one I've always been particularly interested in because it um, supports pa patient support communities. Um, and this is a, a a virtual world in which uh, people go in using their avatars and communicate within the, those those worlds with some sort of visual representation, usually in the form of uh, a, a, a female or a male avatar. And around each of these, you see a number of resources. And I think that's the important thing about these uh, these communities that take part partly online and partly offline, is that people don't just go in there to just have a, um, an incidental communica communication conversation, or at least they usually don't. They usually go in there for some specific purpose. So I think increasingly we're seeing the blending of uh, various forms of online community communication with such things as digital libraries and digital um, information resources, such as medical resources, medical libraries, uh, medical records, those, those kinds of, of things. So the online world um, is interesting because we see a lot of interesting and strange things happening there. People work for free often. People tell everybody about their life, and that is one of the most amazing things. And in the children's communities, of course, we have to be particularly careful about that because we have issues of safety uh, that we have to safeguard, but it applies to all of us as, as well. Uh, people trust each other when maybe they shouldn't trust each other, and these are all issues that we're all wrestling with in various ways. To a very large extent, uh, as you'll see, I think usability as we have known it for 15 or 20 years or so um, remains relatively similar for online, uh, online communities and in online communications. And that's certainly the case for me because I differentiate between usability and sociability. Some people do not. Some people see sociability and the way that sociability is applied in design as being um, an elaboration of user satisfaction uh, in, in, in usability. So I think of uh, sociability and its, um, and its relationship to usability as, in, as being the embodiment of a number of social interactions. And these are the kinds of things that are often 
important in some of these community spaces. Not all of them, of course, and it really depends in the about the kind of community space that you're talking about uh, and the kind of software that, that supports it. But very often, just as in the face-to-face -face world, we see that leadership is important, somebody who stands out, somebody who gives leadership, somebody who gives direction. Um, we see that information and support, this was particularly the case in studies that uh, I did on the patient support communities that I've, I've just mentioned. People want to exchange information, obtain information, but they also want support, support of various kinds, maybe emotional support or it may be uh, support in using the technical software. Governance <coughs> is important whether we think of those governance models as being explicit uh, or we think of them as being implicit, developed through the development of the norms of the community over a period of time. And this you'll see coming into the uh, children's uh, digital library community that I'll show you in just a moment. Recognition and feedback. Uh, and again, this uh, shows itself very clearly in many, many different kinds of, of communities. And again, it will show itself in the uh, children's communities where issues of recognition and identity are showing themselves to be very important. Entertaining, if you have somebody there or a group of people who are there who are amusing and entertaining, they very often can hold the community uh, together, uh, either at times when it's struggling or at times when there is very little communication and um, there doesn't seem to be much happening in the community. And of course that we can actually uh, use those communities with, with very little effort. And that's where we sort of map all of these things onto the, the usability issue that we actually have access, that we have the basic access that we need and we have the basic usability. And when I think about this, I think about sociability as being mostly involved with communications between humans via technologies. So I differentiate here, whereas I think of sociability as being the communication between humans via technology. <coughs> and it's, uh, we can do a lot in our design processes by thinking about the people who are using the system, their purposes, and particularly the sort of policies that, that guide them. And to some extent, this is very similar to the kinds of things that we've talked about in HCI for, for years, except... The one big difference, of course, is the issue of policy. And those policies may be formal, uh, or they may be formal governance policies, or they may be informal, uh, based, on, based on the norms of the communities uh, built up over a period of time. And I think of uh, usability as the communication between humans and technology. Um, and, and that, for me, makes it a little bit different, or quite a lot different, actually, from so sociability. And then, of course, what we're actually concerned with is the mapping between those two. We're concerned with understanding the sociability, the social processes that go on, and thinking about how we map the sociability um, and to the usability and to any community <coughs> management, and, of course, to the underlying functionality uh, of, of the systems. But I deal mostly with the interfaces uh, and, and the, the social management that happens in those community spaces. So most of this talk is going to be sort of exploring and thinking of uh, trying to work out what sociability is needed in the design of these children's international digital library communities. And this just shows the kinds of things that I take into account in sociability. And many of these are, are areas that I've worked on over the years, so I would put in there such things as uh, I, I would I call it participation or not participation. It's often referred to as lurking, or if you know Etienne Wenger's work on um, uh, online communities or communities of practice, he refers to it as legit as legitimate um, a legitimate per, uh, peripheral uh, participation, legitimate peripheral participation. Um, which is a rather more long-winded way of describing it, but is basically talking about whether people are actively communicating or whether they're uh, participating in, in a community either passively by not actually appearing to do anything, but often learning what's going on in that community. They're learning the ambience of that community, and they're learning who is who in the community and 
how to in interact in much the same way as if you go into a crowded room, you go to a party, you sort of sound things out a little bit before you suddenly jump into, um, jump into a, a, a conversation. And to me that's important and there's been something that actually has annoyed me for, for, for some years because for a number of years, and I think it's now starting to change, people have looked at participation only as being uh, what you actively do and that as being the only sort of valid and useful participation in these social community spaces. But in fact, what people do when they're just watching and they're learning about what's going on is, is a very valid activity that can lead to uh, either improved or certainly good participation later on. Which seems, when you think of it, and you compare that to the way people behave in their everyday lives in social spaces, seems to me to be absolutely obvious. But um, it hasn't always been, and it hasn't always been to software designers. So uh, that, that has been a, a point of difference that I felt with, with many people doing work in this area. Um, and also a number of, of other topics some of which I've worked on, which is the social support, the empathy, reciprocity, uh, communication and common ground, issues of social presence, etiquette, uh, collaboration and competition. These are all things that we need to take into account when we're thinking about sociability and um, social interaction in these online areas. Uh, and there's probably others as well. <coughs> and then the mapping of this actually involves thinking about these and thinking about how they map and how they can be made available to people through the technology, through the dialogue interaction, through information navigation, through the access. And the thing that I was just talking to, mentioning to Tim, is that there are many um, ways of defining usability, but a quick, short, easy hand way, I think, is to think about software that is designed for users so that it's consistent, controllable, and predictable. So the project that um, I want to... You know that much software is predictable to those who design it. Right. So the issue is whether the constants are clear enough to be predicted by the user. Absolutely. I'm, I'm shifting a little over to, to, to emphasize the design issue. Yes, the absolutely. Design of constructs. Yes, yeah. And, and absolutely it's the users that need to... And I think for years we've all encountered software that... I mean, and many of the recent pieces of software that are so-called predictable and easy to use, and they're anything but that, to those of us who've not had the insights to, to see how they were designed. Yeah. Um, on this question, you're saying that there are um, opposing views almost about lurkers. Mm -hmm. um, my experience then is, is, is that there are two types of comments about these communities. <coughs> there are comments by outside looking in and thinking they understand how the community works. Right. And, and uh, people who are actually part of the community, but also at the same time thinking about how the community works. Do you think that those two points of view are represented by those two groups of people? Um, I know what you mean. Um, and sometimes people pr pass from being one group to the other. They're just observing what's going on and then not expecting to be part of the community, but then gradually they get sucked into it. So I think it can be. Um, a spectrum, and they can, or they can be different groups. N um, no, I, I don't totally agree. I mean, I guess what I was, um, what I was thinking about was, I actually have a very good friend that Tim knows from Microsoft, Mark Smith, and Mark is a sociologist. And for many, I suppose, for four or five years now, he and I have debated a lot about uh, what participation actu actually involves. And I think a lot of uh, what, of course, Microsoft's been interested in tracking is uh, what people actually do online, particularly using their software, a piece of software called NetScan that you, can, that you can use for tracking activities in these community spaces. And his interest is in how you learn about the activities that are, that are happening there, particularly with reference to Microsoft products and uh, who is available in the communities that can provide help for, the, for those projects. But he's not alone. I've found a number of, of researchers who've tended to be just very focused on the in, on those people who interact with the software and not the people who uh, may be available. And in the work that I've done um, with uh, a, a student who's now at the University of Guelph in Toronto, Blair Nonicky, is that we found largely different 
um, lurking behavior, if you want to call it lurking. I've tried for many years to, 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 uh, to call it silent participants and various other names like that that people didn't want to pick up or just didn't pick up within the computing community. But you find, for example, that um, we looked at a uh, hundred different um, lists, uh, bulletin board communities. Um, and one group was um, medical, medical support communities and another group was technical support communities. And of, and this was with, sorry, this was the list service, not bulletin boards, um, because everybody was registered. And we found that approximately 75 or so of the people registered in the technical support communities were either lurking or just not participating at all. And the number in the medical support communities was much less than that. And then when we went deeper into reasons why people don't participate, there's a whole range of different reasons, you know, ranging from uh, they may not be able to use the software. They may feel that other people are saying the things that they're saying. They may actually be just uh, spending their time on the sort of outsides of the community while they uh, learn what's happening there so that they have the courage to go in and participate. They may be learning about the kind of conversational structures that go on and, and, and how they should best present their ideas. There's a whole, there's a whole set of things um, that, that are concerned with that. Uh, certainly in the past, most media comments about growth of the web or this and the other were made by journalists who never used them. Right. So they hadn't, they, and most, I'm afraid, I dismiss most of their comments as just being nonsense, you know, because they, didn't, they, they had a complete misunderstanding of the dynamics of what was going on. But at another level, I would say, I've, I've heard a lot of people about talking about all these different online communities, and nobody ever mentions IRC. Right. which is an, an immensely powerful right. online community method, methodology yes. adopted by tens of thousands yes. of people. But it, it's it's a hacker community. You right. have to understand that it's there before you know, know, know yeah. to get in. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I think people used to mention that much more, but I guess we're all a little bit, you know, we tend to sort of go with the more recent technologies, so it's got a little bit left behind. But yeah, but the open source development community is using IRC in a very powerful way right. to, to work on global cooperation or software. Right. Sorry. Now, now, isn't this essentially like social life everywhere, that when you get to a new community of any kind, you, you have to lurk and hang out? It doesn't make yeah. sense to, to start uh, throwing your weight around early. Yeah. So. Absolutely, yeah. And that's why, I've, it, in, in some ways, it's sort of surprising that I think you know, and again, this is maybe the division between people who work in the more social areas and more usability-oriented areas to the more uh, the technical groups. Who well, well technical people are socially uh, a little, often handicapped in certain ways and would not recognize these issues. Right. You said that, not me. <laughs> okay. I'm not a technical person. <laughs> this, this is um, a project, um, and it... It builds on the International Children's Digital Library that Ben mentioned. There's a big team of us. Some of us are um, more HCI, online communities types of people. Um, ben Bederson is a, works with Ben Schneiderman. He's a, a HCI, strong uh, computer scientist. Um, we have people who work in Mexico. We have Hungarians, Anita Komlodi, who's also a specialist in um, cross-cultural communication. Philip Resnick, who is a linguist, um, and, and, there, and Alison Druin, of course, who leads the project, who is a specialist in, in children's technologies. And we're also working with students and teachers in Argentina, Hungary, Mexico, uh, in the USA. And thanks to our sponsors, National Science Foundation and Microsoft Research, uh, we're able to do this project. And this project builds on the International Children's uh, Digital Library, which is the work of Alison and Ben, uh, Alison Druin and Ben Bederson, and this International Children's Digital Library um, develops kids, it develops books or puts online books for children. And our aim is to develop a kids' book community uh, that supports, supports the social interaction online, one that is entertaining and fun and challenging and safe. And it builds to a very large extent on work that Alison has done over the years. And I'll talk a bit more about her methods as we go through. Because although she's very well versed, uh, as I am, to a lesser extent in, in the children's psychology sides of, of this, the, the uh, Piaget and others, um, Alison works very much with teams of children and tries to understand her young user groups and translate that into 
the, the software. So she works with what she calls intergenerational design teams. So at any point, uh, you see groups of kids and various groups of adults working very, very closely together. And the ideas for the software that you'll see are in various stages of prototypes, some of them rather rudimentary prototypes, they're drawings by kids, which we then use and uh, th think about how to translate into software that the children can actually use. So the kinds of issues that we're interested in is how should we support communication between children who speak different languages? And we're not doing machine translation or we're not doing very much machine translation. So this is in itself challenging. Um, how do we support cross-cultural understanding? And this project grew out of, um, well, really, in, in, in a way, our idea arose after 9-11. Uh, and one of the things that we were thinking about at that time, after the, the bombing of the, the, or the planes running into the, the World Trade Center, was, you know, how can we support people in understanding each other's culture a little bit better? Um, even though we're only individuals and we're only a small group, what can we do? And uh, as a group of researchers, what can we do? And one of the things that we were thinking quite a lot about is how can we help children to understand that children from different parts of the country are different, or different parts of the world are different, they have different interests, they behave in different ways, but they also have a lot of things that uh, are in common. And building a lot on Olpert's uh, work, particularly from 1988, he's a, a, a specialist in cross-cultural communication, and particularly amongst children. Um, yes. Yes. Um, and he talks a lot about base, the kinds of things that, again, one would think was, was, was fairly obvious, but which we're trying to think about and build into software, is that, you know, the more you help people to understand their similarities, particularly their similarities, but also their differences, and become intrigued with each other's differences and identify and empathize with each uh, each other's similarities, the more likely you are to build uh, collaborations and uh, understanding uh, between the, those groups of people in general, but particularly children. And Alison's work very much focuses on this, uh, and she has a book that's published in 1999 called um, Children's Technology, in which she particularly identifies the things that children enjoy when they come online. And there's such things as being able to do things. Well, not a surprise, but you know, being engaged, being able to do things, being highly engaged. Um, collaborating with other children is an important one, not working in, in isolation. And also being challenged, having something challenging to do. And those, um, those particular principles underpin a lot of technology that seems to be successful with children. And then the other area of interest, and one which is, uh, is my interest, is how you um, give group identity and individual identity. And although we haven't found the answers to this research at the moment, one thing that interests me a great deal is how um, individual identity, of which we all have various types of individual identity in our, uh, in our real world life, um, how we can represent that online, how you can allow people to represent that online, and then how uh, individual identity is um, tempted to say morphed, but morphed into a group identity, or maybe um, collects, fused, thank you, fused into a, a group identity. And so th this is what we're working with, with the children. And we're working with this, uh, this software called International Children's Digital Library. And you should take down the URL. It's very fun to go into this. It's just called uh, ICDL, International Children's Digital Library Books org. And there are many wonderful things. Ben's slide showed some of these, but you can search for books in a variety of different ways. You can search for books on their color, on their size, on whether they make children feel happy, feel sad, and you can put various of these characteristics together. So I can look for a book that is big, that has a green cover, that will make me feel happy, and that's written in Spanish. 
or it's written in Hungarian, or it's written in many other different kinds of languages. And not only can you do that, but you can read the books in different kinds of ways. You can, you, there are different readers where you can read by turning pages, which is sort of the obvious ways, or the spiral readers. So there's a number of, of different ways that you can read that. So particularly, if you've got kids, go and play in this area, because you'll, you'll enjoy uh, working with this software. What age group does it it, it's used by a lot of different age groups, actually. Um, the group that we're working with is children seven to nine years old, but it's used by some children that are younger than that, fives, fours, fives, and sixes, and it's used by kids that are up to their early teens, and it's used by adults. And in fact, um, I don't remember if I've put the, st the stats, I don't think I've put all the statistics up here, but after the US, the next major user are the Iranians. And we think they use that for they use it for uh, people to learn English, and then after that comes Taiwan. So it's used by a lot of adults for language learning What's as, the copyright as well. Situation? Are these just old books or books that have been released by the publishers? Or um, they're either old books or they're books that have been released by the, the publishers. Um, and unlike um, the Google Stanford group that is just putting a lot of material online, every single one of these has its copyright cleared. I don't get involved with that side. We have people who are specialists in library and, and copyright. Um, so that's why, I mean, a thousand books is an enormous number of books. If you've, cha if you've cleared or obtained permission or found old books to, to get all the copyrights cleared, but every single one of those has the permission for them to, to be up there. Um, so the books are uh, in 35 languages. The website is in 10, or maybe I think Ben said 15, actually. Maybe it's, they've put even more versions up now. And the users come from 158 different countries. And this, this site is evolving all of the time. Um, and it was first launched in 2002. And one of the things about doing sort of communities research is that it's... Uh, and I suppose sociologists have this problem all the time, actually. But there's the problem of, you know, do I try and do my research and create the community to do the research on so that I know the history of that community? Or maybe I can even try and con control that community in some way or other. Uh, and, of course, that's a very long process and usually not one that most of us want to get involved in. Or do I get permission to go and study these communities. And in this particular case, uh, one of the things I said to Alison is, you know, you've got this amazing International Children's Digital Library, and wouldn't it be wonderful to support children's communities around this resource? And that's indeed what we're doing. I'm just going to, I'm not going to talk about this at all, but I'm just going to put those up in case there is any uh, computer scientists in the audience who want to know a little bit more about this. Um, this slide really indicates how, how Alison and how our team work with children. And you can't quite see how she's dressed there, but she's dressed in a pair of dirty old jeans and she sits on the floor as all of us do. One of the requirements for being in this project is that, uh, and if I'm at a dean's meeting, I have to go and do a quick change because I can't go in a suit. I have to put on a pair of trousers and an old t-shirt and be prepared to sit on the floor and, and use crayons and draw things on the floor with the kids. And so this is part of our intergenerational design team. And they're working with, with Alison just sitting on the floor. Uh, you'll see this picture actually probably again. Uh, here they're actually building the end of a story for one of the books from the, the, the library. And what we did from the very beginning was uh, the children uh, explored and wrote stories. And we were trying to understand what it is that these children can and communicate with each other, even though they don't speak each other's languages. And so the first activity involved them in uh, reading a book, and the same book was, was read in Hungary. And then they wrote the end, they rewrote the end of the story themselves. And they just did this on paper. And then the end of that story went over to Hungary, to our team over in Hungary. And here you see the, the US kids. Um, they're creating their, their stories, uh, their new story endings. and. Well, sorry, there's the Hungarian kids, they're creating their new story endings and they're sending it to the, U to the US. And by working in this sort of way, we managed to get ideas about the kinds of things that the children like to do and the sorts of things that were, um, uh, were, were, were in, important to them. And we, in fact, got an enormous amount of information just through doing that. Yeah? Are the story endings in words or pictures? 
The story endings were in pictures. Yeah, sorry, that's an important thing. They drew their, they drew their story endings. Sometimes they put a few words in there, but it was not to be a written story. And these are children that are seven to nine, and they work a lot just on the floor using crayons, they're cutting out pictures, drawing pictures, that, that kind of thing. And I are mean, they unambiguous? No, they're ambiguous, and you'll see how we, we deal with that. And one of the things that, incidentally, we actually found is that children pref the children prefer to draw rather than to cut out pictures. And our linguist in the group was very eager to build up a whole database of words and pictures. And the kids were really the kids were much more interested in doing their own drawings. So we based a lot of our our tools on, on that. And one of the things that came out very early on, we took this picture because, and this is our Hungarian um, partner, she actually works uh, in, in, in the US at a sister institution in Maryland, and then luckily her mother works um, as, at a Sunday school. But one of the things we discovered very early on is that the kids spotted the camera, and the camera was actually to videotape their sessions when they were, were working together, but the kids went and put themselves in front of the camera. So we took pictures of them to send back to the children in America, and, you know, we knew that identity was going to be an important issue. Uh, I mean, partly we knew this because children like to show themselves, but also, you know, reading the literature and in previous work, one of the key things that you always um, sort of understand in these community spaces is people's identity is, is a very important feature for, to them and how you display that identity or you allow them to display that identity and represent and communicate that identity online is important. And so the kids, it was interesting that kids did this sort of automatically. So this, they draw, uh, after they've been drawing the story endings, and they do this on paper, we got some drawings of the kinds of things that the children thought should go in the software. And of course, I'm shortcutting this a bit because there were several sort of weeks of working with the children and talking about the ideas and getting them used to the idea that they would be sending drawings to Hungary and the Hungarian children would be sending them back and eventually we would be building software for them to use. And the other thing about this group of children is that this is, um, these kids are, uh, they're not especially talented children, but they are children who are brought in week after week after week. So they get to know the kinds of activities, and then they also stay for, uh, usually for two years. So always part of the kids' team, there are children who have been doing this work for a while. So this one, and you'll see this comes out in some of the, the prototypes early on, they knew that they needed a drawing area, which needed to be here for doing that, and this represents the book pages. Uh, these notes here are the adults' notes, but they knew that they wanted to be able to draw things. This was actually bread. This was a drawing from the Spanish, from the Hungarian book that they were working on. Um, the person, of course. Um, they knew that they needed to be able to see the drawings, and they needed drawing tools. They were all strongly influenced, I think, by Microsoft interfaces. So, so they knew they wanted clip art and to cut and paste. And that sort of refers to the, the discussion that was going on earlier on about um, Henry Ford and, and the horses. Um, you know, I think it's, it's uh, a very interesting sort of balance between how much you take from the users and how much you sort of um, empower the users to think beyond what they would normally um, normally be thinking about. And of course, this is very challenging because with the kids, we there's a sort of combination of both. And Alison and her team, I think, is particularly good at sort of understanding the sort of depths of what the children want and then representing that in software. And they knew they needed, they wouldn't be able to understand each other's drawings all the time and they had to have an, a space where they could ask questions and get answers. So that represented a very early kind of drawing idea. And from that, we sort of worked on Story Maker. And here you see the kids just working at the computer with Story Maker. And we started to work on Story Maker and some other tools. And the next part of the, the project was with Mexico and Maryland. These, the, we're working with these different language and different cultural groups. And so we were focusing on particularly um, thinking about the time that it takes the children to get to know each other. Uh, the role of individual and national identity and cross-culture and the usability that's associated with those things. And the first 
uh, pilot study was a fairly brief one in Hungary. We just went for a, a short period of time, um, just a week, to try and get a feel for how the different groups of children uh, responded to each other and responded to the ideas. This one, we worked with a, a, a much more developed prototype, but, but one that still has a lot of work to, to do on it. And we worked for a time frame of eight weeks in the fall last year. Um, we worked with two private elementary schools in, in Maryland in the USA and uh, two in Monterey in Mexico. And each of them had four boys and three girls, or bottom one had four boys and four girls, um, between ages between seven and nine years old. And the activities that we focused on were getting to know each other. This was another thing that came out of the early trials was we built in time for the kids to get to know each other between the two cultural groups, but we didn't build in a long, long enough time. Um, it actually takes a lot of team building activities both within the teams and between the teams to get any kind of meaningful interaction. And in fact, uh, I'll show you some slides of, of some of the activities in a minute, but it, it, even when we'd focused several weeks of the children meeting twice a week because they had to do this within the, the time frame of the, the, school, um, the school day, we still realized that it takes even longer than four or five weeks of just these early getting to know, act, get, getting to know each other activities to really build up a rapport so that the children uh, are communicating with each other. I don't know if there is a way of shortcutting that or even if it's desirable to shortcut it. But we did all kinds of things. This is a sort of blind man's buff um, and various other, even quite physical games. This, these were the groups of children in Mexico. They came from different schools, so they didn't know each other, and they didn't, and even the ones from the same schools, they didn't know each other all that well. So you can see we've got all kinds of games going on that are just um, basically party games, break the ice kind of games. And the same thing here, these are the American kids doing, doing s sets of games here. We spent a lot of time doing physical games first, and then uh, gradually uh, pa pencil and paper games, and gradually moving on to the computer. This one is, uh, th these are the girls. Uh, these girls are from the American schools. Um, the boys are from Mexico. And the girls, interestingly, are working on identity, and they're drawing what they think of as identity. Almost always, uh, and these are some more of them, almost always the girls thought about identity in terms of themselves. The boys thought of identity in terms often of football, monsters, things like that. So there are real gender differences going on here. And they, draw, they drew things to sort of, you know, to use as their identity. This one was amazingly complex. I'm not quite sure what that was about. Sorry. I think it was a, could be, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Um, so various pictures that represented something about, uh, about themselves that they thought was, was important. Um, and well, why did you need to get them to explicitly explore identity? Because in my experience, if you give kids a piece of paper, We, we wanted to do this explicitly because we knew that when we moved to the online world that we needed to provide tools for them that would enable them to represent themselves on, on messages that they sent to the other children. So, so, they that, have so that they have representations. And I've, I've found in previous work actually that you, know, you can do that in all kinds of ways and some people, um, some computer-based learning environments actually take photographs of people, but often, particularly younger kids, like, like to draw. And sometimes adults do too. Uh, in the early days of the OU, actually, uh, this would be like 20 or more years ago, they gave very, very simple drawing tools, but very effective ones that people could just draw, like big glasses or a moustache or something that just represented them, and they were very effective ways of, of portraying identity. Um, so the activities that they were involved in was individual and group representation using the ICDL community software. This is when they moved on to the software. Um, reading a story from the, from the ICDL book, creating a new story ending, 
to that story and then exchanging the stories between the countries. And the story that uh, we were working with was a Spanish story, The Sweet, Sweet Tree of Mangoes, uh, which they, they each read in their own languages, actually. And then they were asked to create a different ending to that story, which they would send to the other children. And they would use a few words, but mostly this was done in, in, in terms of drawing. So they could take the characters out of the story, but they could also make different endings. So you can see the kids using the, the basic prototypes here. These are the, the Mexican kids who, we always had them working in twos. We didn't believe in children working individually. They worked best in twos. This helped with not having too many machines, but I think even if we'd had enough machines, we still would have had the kids working with, in twos. Because you'll remember earlier that one of the things I said about the ways children like to, to work is they like to collaborate. And so the kids would support each other um, and they would work together and help each other to, to use the software. Mostly they interacted nicely. Sometimes the, the uh, desire to create monsters got a little out of hand with a few of the boys, but apart from that it was, was basically okay. So we had a number of different tools and um, this was the basic sort of, sort of login um, for first time users, just the Spanish edition and the English edition. And the three, the three main areas of tools, one is the story maker, the story exchange, and the get to know each other tool. And uh, you can see that the interface also, we had a Spanish version of the interface as well. And so this, is, this was the get to know each other tool, where they were encouraged to um, give their name, uh, a secret word, um, when, when they were born, um, their age and various things about themselves and also to do a drawing. We ended up with too many things down here actually, too many, too many questions for them but they didn't need to uh, fill all those in but often they would work with each other or they would work with an adult to do that. And here you can see the drawing area and you can see that there's various um, colored pens, there's also an eraser, there's a colored palette, uh, and, and various things that they can use to draw. And Why you can you choose to have so much real estate taken up by the logo? Um, well, this is partly an early prototype. I guess we, uh, the, I mean, we've got some things that go up here, which is the home, the writing, the different tools that you can get to, that you can get to, but yeah, I agree that this is is largely open. It's the of the the, yeah, the colours actually, the colours were chosen um, in the first instance uh, largely by the, the children, but also with help from the designers as well. I don't know why they chose to have. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure why. Do you know Ben? Yeah, I don't know why. They, that's an they intrusive made, feature of many, yeah. of many commercial. Of software. Yeah. They're not giving you all the real estate you want to have. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, don't, I don't know why. We were mostly focused on the tools, I must admit, but that's a good point. Yeah. Um, this was the, um, the, the getting to know you, and here you can see where they've, they've drawn their representations. These were mostly the sort of, this was an individual boy uh, who wanted to be represented by football, and this was a group the group from Monterey. If you've ever been to Monterey, when you fly into Monterey, there's a very spectacular sort of mountain there, which is really the icon for the, the, the whole town. So, so they chose that. Um, there's the group of, group of girls working in Mexico. Um, this is the uh, making, this is part of making a story. And here you can see that um, they've got some things, they've got some main characters that they can pull out of a database or they can go in and cut things out of a database, uh, sorry, from the, the picture books or they can actually draw. So these were the, some of the things that they selected, key characters from the, the, the database. At the beginning we didn't actually build up a database hardly at all. We had the children mostly doing cutting and drawing themselves. Um, but that takes a while, so it takes rather a long time. So we. Uh, basically compromised. We made small databases, small number of things in them, and the, the kids also add to them. So you can see here where they've added all kinds of different things. They've gone in and cut some things. <coughs> One of the things they like to do a lot is they like to take basic features and then add to them. So they'll put, uh, they'll sometimes put, you know, fruit on trees, or they'll draw different kinds of face, 
or they'll do something that's a little bit different. I'm not sure what this weird character was. It's some sort of wolf here. <laughs> some sort, yeah, um, some sort of wolf. You can see they've got some suns there and some attempts to write here. So they're, they're building up their stories. This is very, this next one I'm going to show you is very early sort of prototype. Um, I wasn't here when they tested this next one, but it looks somewhat, it looks rather complicated to me, but uh, I'm told that the children managed to use this okay. This was basically, there's different areas here, but we wanted them to be able to, when they saw, sent each other stories, um, they sent the stories to the other community to be able to ask questions. And this is a question answering template. So one of the things that the kids were very, very interested in was the moods of the people involved. So they wanted to know, uh, is the old man sad? So they picked an icon which showed sadness, which is, is this one here, clicked on it, put it there, and put a question mark next to it. So old man, sad, question mark, and the answer comes back, no. So they're develop developing a pigeon. Yeah, they're developing their own sort of pigeon. You could think of it as a pigeon language, but pictorial. Well, a pictorial rather, kind rather of... like sign language. Yeah, with the tools a, that pic a, pic a kind of pictorial pigeon language. Oh. Kids like to draw. I mean, one of the things about adults is that they would get very, very frustrated. I mean, could you imagine doing this as an adult? It would drive you crazy. Um, but one of the things that we found with the kids was they actually are very... It, it's like a game to them. Uh, and particularly learning about somebody else's culture, they get very excited, they get very interested in it. And, I mean, we did a lot of exercises that brought them to, to this point. So it was interesting to see how they work. Um, so that is a bigger version of that. So this is the one I just mentioned. Is the old man sad? No, he's not sad. Um, another one is, you know, that this is a more complicated kind of question. Um, did he... Did he uh, did he grow the tree? Um, so there's some different different things in here, and the answer to that one is no. I'm not. Uh, this is to do with money, um, and I'm not sure what this what what this means, and even what the kids thought of it, whether that one worked or not. But those are the sorts of. This is just very early. It's the sort of conceptual ideas that we're working with. Is easy ways of allowing children to uh, pick out a picture of a, a part of a picture whether it was their own diet, their own drawing, or whether it's something um, taken from the database. And they've done this with their own drawings as well. And just ask simple questions. And one of the things, we, as I say, we found out very early on is the kids are very interested in moods. That did, did he like this? Did he like the money? Did he like working? Uh, did he like planting the tree? All of this. There's a lot of emotional um, issues that are involved. This is one of our Mexican partners and she's interviewing a couple of the Mexican uh, boys that were involved. We had a very simple questionnaire uh, which basically used a, th a three-point Likert scale but was just um, smiley faces, a smiley face, uh, a smiley face, a sad face and a straight mouth. And they, for each of the questions, the questions would be read out and they would circle those or in this case questions were read out and the actual interview was interviewer was circling the answers for them. So our basic findings, and this is really just right at the, pretty early on in this project, is you know just how much the kids enjoy drawing, how much they enjoy this, act, these kinds of activities. The boys in general were, were more active than the girls. Uh, when we talked to them about you know the differences that they expected, this was one part of part of the project to talk about what they expected uh, from the children from the other country. Um, they could talk about such things as their age and their gender, but they hadn't really got concepts of such things as cities and states and those sort of more complex concepts at this age. What age is it? Seven to nines. Um, they could understand that people from different countries speak different languages and play different games. The playing of different games was really important to them and uh, they were very intrigued to know, and this was a very motivating kind of uh, factor in their stories, they were very intrigued to find out about um, the children from the other countries. And this sort of led into some of the Allput work, which we hadn't really unearthed any of until now, but it really brought to the surface various stereotypes. <coughs> um, when the American children were asked what they thought of the, the, the Mexican children in one of the very early activities, they 
uh, they thought that they were lucky because uh, they had Cancun, which is a popular holiday resort there. Uh, and they also gave some, you know, rather nasty stereotypes that come from the attitudes of uh, American society to Mexicans in America. So they thought of them as people who took American jobs, people who, um, who, did, who were not very clean, all of these not very nice stereotypes that they got from the media and maybe from parents and elsewhere. Yeah? How much do you think the, the drive to, towards stereotypes comes from the books themselves? We this don't. Is yeah. Simple characterization in the yeah. We we don't know that yet, mm. uh, and we haven't got as far as probing that. But that's something that we we obviously should probe is where those stereotypes come from. And at the moment, we're just very very early on. And yes, we could be planting by the choice of books. We could be planting the stereotypes there themselves. Um, the questions that first that came out from the first set of getting to know you and things to talk about were before they were introduced to the book. So we know on this particular occasion that they came from more from sort of general society. Um, we found in the individual identity that there were interest, some interesting gen gender differences here, that the girls tended to draw themselves uh, and the boys tended to draw evil monsters and footballs. <laughs> that, that tended to be the things that they were interested in. Uh, so when it came to the team identity, which they were particularly asked to, to think about, they worked, first of all, how would you like to show yourself? And then when you're working it with your partner or with two other people, how would you like to show your team? And the girls used um, images uh, from their group. So further back, I showed you a slide in which there were three girls and three different pictures. They actually stuck those three pictures together and said, okay, that's my, that's my group identity. So one thing we're very eager to find out more about is how children move from individual identity to group identity as they form teams and how we can understand more about uh, how to represent identity, how to support, how to support them in uh, describing their own identity, and, and, and basically how the process of group identity gradually takes over from individual identity. And this is with children, but of course this would also be an interesting thing to find out with, with adults in these online community spaces, because the whole issue of, of group and individual identity are important ones there's, there as well. Um, the boys, when it came to group identity, tended to agree on such things as names of video games, soccer's, monsters, those kinds of things. I haven't talked much about usability problems, but it was a very early, stereo, uh, very early prototype, and there were quite a lot of problems. Uh, with the usability, which we hope to get sorted out for this summer when we go back again. Um, such things as long drop-down boxes, they found, the children found difficult to manipulate. Um, they confused drop-down boxes with text boxes. Um, one thing they wanted to be able to do, and in fact we didn't realize they would want to be able to do this, but they loved doing their own prototype, their own profiles, so they would go in and keep changing prototype, keep changing their profiles, and they, each person developed many different profiles. Um, so that's something that we need to, to think about. Uh, we developed, we observed such things that are, you know, pretty uh, standard, like the eraser function was too aggressive, and when they used it, it took too much of their drawings away. And the templates for asking and answering questions were difficult to deal with. And you saw some rough templates there, which were, I think, very overambitious, actually. Um, so apart from the things I've mentioned before... We saw templates. I mean, the, the, the little things with the smiley faces that they exchanged were created by them or by the... The, the templates were created by them. So the smiley faces was um, a sort of palette at which you could you could select, say, a person like the old man, and then if you wanted to ask the question of, you know, was he happy or was he sad, and they often wanted to know with the, the human characters and the, the animal characters, was it a happy cat, was it a sad cat or whatever, they could then just pick that template. So they, they, they clicked on the image and they clicked on the appropriate bit of the template and put them together. Those they could do quite easily. It's the other ones that were, that were more complex, like... Um, you know, did he did he plant did, did he plant the tree? And, and other ones, which there are some that are either ors as well. So was it a this? Uh, 
Uh, no, we don't. Not really past tense. We're really dealing in communicating concepts, but they do want to know such things as, um, you know, f from some of their own drawings. Was it a cat or was it a rabbit? Children's drawings you often can't easily differentiate, so they would get they would put the different images together, and as they use this more, they would also pick up bits of the language which we knew was going to happen, but we weren't deliberately teaching language. So they and, and some of them would you know the. Kids from Monterey knew some English because they learn English quite early in school, and the kids in America learn, often they've learned some Spanish. But we didn't set out to either do machine translation or to do language teaching. What we know about children is that they love to draw. You know, they really love to draw. They love to cut out, they love to draw, and they love to tell stories, and they love to be challenged. So receiving your story, I mean, you've had the pleasure of drawing it, you send it to me, I have the challenge of interpreting it, and then I, then I can find out you know, if I've interpreted it correctly. And, you know, and, and so there is a backwards and forwards. And we, we organized this um, with teachers, of course, which made the environment very safe. So they would get involved in an activity one week, and they would send it to the other country. And then they would come back on whatever day their class was, a Tuesday, and they would get the answers back, and they would work with those, and they would do some more. They would send it off, and then Thursday, some more answers would come back. So they basically had, had um, each group had two one-hour lessons, or one hour and ten minutes or so, per week to work on these things, uh, with, with adult supporters, yeah. So, I mean, the other interesting thing about this is that you know, uh, I was talking about working with these sort of community types of projects. I mean, in a way where it's such an early exploratory stage of this, it isn't quite, I mean, we're doing development and exploratory research to do that development. So it's really at that very, very early stage. Um, and we're using observation and I, I guess... You know, ethnographers would be horrified if I called this ethnography, but it's a kind, I guess it's a form of um, requirements collection. H -H -E. Yes, yes, it's a form of requirements uh, collect connection that collection that uses almost a form of, of modified ethnography. Human computer ethnography. Something like that, yes, to try and understand what these, these children are doing and also to. Uh, to, to basically learn, I mean, we know what some of the research questions are, but as we do this, we're learning more and more what the research questions are. So it's, it's very exploratory. So as well as the, um, as well as the things that I mentioned that we're, we're working on, if you take a much bigger jump ahead, um, I think there is an importance in focusing on sociability and collaboration as well as the usability, that just to think about usability is not enough. We need to think about how we map you know, these social interactions and these social processes into, um, in, into uh, software and into the interface. And this is a nice, a nice quote, three helping one another will achieve as much as six working singly. We certainly found with our kids that they loved working together. I mean, they really did enjoy working together. Who said this? Um, that is an unknown, that's, it's a Spanish proverb originally and an unknown author. And I think, did you find this then or did I? Where did it come from? Yeah. Um, so, the, so this sort of encourages us to go for these sort of further along the line, if you like, future directions of trying to support people who don't normally connect in parts of the world where um, they may not have uh, as, as rich an access to technologies as we have, uh, to be able to integrate different people, different kinds of people with different types of, te of technologies. And we're thinking particularly about how we can use mobile technologies and mobile phones to work with printing devices or various forms to, to be able to support children in communicating with each other across the world in different, different groups. At the moment, this is sort of very technology rich, and we carry in our laptops and it would be good to be thinking of working uh, for example with the mobile technologies uh, in areas such as Brazil we have Brazilian colleagues who are interested in this project and and many others uh, to make it more easily accessible to people who can't afford laptops we're interested in thinking about how the merging of online and, and offline happens um, and how this happens at 
early ages with children as well as with adults. I think some of these questions actually apply to, to adult communities and how people manage you know, their face-to-face -face sort of life and their, their virtual life and how they communicate within the face-to-face -face world and they commu communicate virtually and how they, how, what crossovers there are between the two. Yeah, on that, early, that last point, you mentioned earlier that it's, it's astounding how much people give away about themselves online. Yeah. And is that partly because you feel like you're on your own when you're sat in a darkened room with a computer? And would that be different if you were in that kind of environment, sat in front of a computer with three other people? Um, I can answer one part of that question. Uh, I, there, there is an interesting paper by uh, Joe Walther in, I think it's Communication Research, um, Journal of Communication Research. There's a few different research uh, journals in communication, and he authors in a couple of them. And I think one is just called Communication, and one is called, called Communication Research, where he talks about um, hyper-emotions. And uh, one of the things that he points out that I think many people people accept that it's particularly nicely articulated in his work is that you know when you go online you leave behind your physical manifestations and so do the people that you're communicating with and you tend to forget that you're communicating often with another human being or maybe thousands or millions of other human beings and you are pretty happy to just write things there and you see this with adults as well as with children that you maybe wouldn't say to people and the other part of that of course is that you can um, you can just disappear, and this is the basis of why people flame and get away with it. You know, people, many people who do flaming online and, and are really nasty to people online would never do it face to face because, you know, there's no threat. I mean, I can't say something nasty to you here because you're sitting. I mean, I can see your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, you're a bit too close. <laughs> you know, but also, you know, you know me. We'll meet again yeah. at various times. So, but you know, if if I was online and I was using a a, a pseudonym for my login, which I probably would would do. I mean, I can just disappear. So why shouldn't I say whatever I want to say? And but the other part of your question was the fact that because when you mention feeling like you've got no body, if you're yeah. someone's sat next to you, like that, then you're not going to forget that you've got the yeah. Well, if, if there's two of you working together online, yeah. yeah, I think it probably does help. I don't, I don't know. Does anybody else know if there's been work on, done on that? I, I don't know the answer to that. But that's a good point about working collaboratively and kids working collaboratively. I mean, it makes sense that they would just be able to remind each other that much more, wouldn't it, doesn't yeah. it? Um, yeah, it's an interesting There's some work by someone called John Backman in the States on... Um, Interview patient interviews for information, oh. and he found that people are very much more honest talking to a computer than they were to a doctor or a nurse. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So yes. they're prepared, and they're prepared to disclose things that they yes. were uncomfortable disclosing. Yes, to other absolutely. People. And and there's interesting work done by Alan Newell at Dundee, a uh, long, long time ago actually, where he where they used computer systems to um, basically to interview rape victims. And people who had, had been through rapes were much more prepared to discuss in, in fairly graphic detail things that they would never, ever have said to another person, and certainly not to the police force that would wanted that information. So, yeah, that's, that's, a, very, that's a very common thing. This is like interviewing tra traumatized children through dolls. <clears throat> yes. Well, uh, yes. Yes, I guess it's got some of the same features, doesn't in it? In, in, in that you're... Pre a, pre a presentation is not being made face-to-face -to, -face to, right. to the interviewer. Right. Right. Although I think with traumatized children, they often play out part of the thing with the doll, don't they? So it's what I think with adults, it's more just that they, they are not face-to-face, -face, so they just say it. They just forget. I mean, I think it's partly the same as, you know, we, we all know from putting, you know, for, for videoing people that you put a video camera up and people are terribly or used to be terribly self-conscious at the beginning and then they forget about it. Yeah. I'm, I'm very interested in the children constantly asking about um, mood. Yeah. Um, th that seems to me to be connected to the well-known phenomenon that if you just communicate by text and you haven't got the normal visual clues, uh, facial expression, tone right. of voice that you would have, right. then most text is really very, very ambiguous. It can be taken yeah. in all sorts of ways. And, and that seems to me that children are very aware of that. If, mm. if there's a picture of something, you know, um, man and the cat. Well, if the man's angry and the cat 
cat's angry, maybe that's because the man's kicked the cat, if you see what I mean. Right. You, you can't sort out the ambiguity right. without getting a lot of clues. Yeah, so they go for it explicitly, you mean, to get mm. to, to really understand oh, it. I yeah. just guess. But yeah. <coughs> Yeah, interesting. The thing I wanted to just mention, if you're, you're interested, I, some of you may know this book, Interaction Design, and my friends and colleagues, Yvonne Rogers and Helen Sharp, that I've worked with for oh, 12, 14, 15 years now, and we're doing a new edition, our second edition. It's just, you know, Ben puts his books up, and I can, we, can, we compete with him, so I was going like, to wave my flyer too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.